Watch the Atheist Experience live Sundays at 4.30 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash ytaxp and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call axp. It's time to get sexy on Secular Sexuality. And welcome to Secular Sexuality, the ACA show inviting you to peer cautiously inside the mind of one James. It doesn't matter how many times you ask me, Christy, I'm not changing my middle name to Nathaniel Boone. My name is Christy Powell. I'm joined again tonight by Jamie Nathaniel Boone. Welcome back, Jamie. <laughs> or perhaps joined by the first by Jamie Nathaniel Boone. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> first time using the name I've been given. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's my atheist middle name. It's You're bestowed athe- upon yeah. me. No, yeah. I mean we work with uh, we work with all kinds of people. Like secular rarity is that a name? Like I think Jamie Nathaniel yeah, you know. Boone. That's a name. That's a name. And B. <laughs> well, you know, tonight we're going to be exploring the life and times of a modern gay atheist. So. Give us a call with your stories and questions. We're at 512-991-9242 or tiny.cc slash call sex because the show is coming right now. All right, Jamie, it's been a long time since you and I have done a show together. Super yeah. excited to, I guess, reintroduce you to the uh, SecX audience. And uh, let's start with what's got you turned on this week. Well, uh, is it cheating if I just say my new boyfriend? Oh, okay, that's adorable. Head over heels for, yeah, in all kinds of different ways. But, yeah, I mean, there's, like, toys that I hadn't used before that we've used, and it's uh, spectacular. So I guess something specific... Um, restraints <laughs> and being able to use them like with another person. It, you know, so. there are so many sexual experiences that you can have by yourself that mm. people don't necessarily take the time to appreciate. Restraints, not so much. I, I'm mm-hmm. excited that you're getting to dust those off a little bit. It's hard. It's hard to uh, be restrained and then also do something on your own to do all of that. It does take some of the fun out of it, for sure. Well, yeah. I mean, so it's a strange thing, but I'm very competitive, and it's (laughs) never more clear, (laughs) at least in my mind, than when it comes to something sexual, because I always want to be the best Mm -hmm. at it. Um, So uh, when I was trying to figure out restraints on my own, it was like a physical challenge (laughs) of getting through. It was like saw, except instead of violence, sex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not to not to inadvertently link those two without thinking about it. I mean, hey, that's a, that's a little mm-hmm. bit what we're here to do. Here to play with some of the weirdness and the uh, the beauty that is. I don't know everything from shibari to just a well used strip of velcro. So uh, excited that you have uh, have found some fun there. Yeah, and then uh, uh, it's funny because I I had toys that I picked up slowly over time, one at a time, figuring stuff out on my own, Mm -hmm. and then I got them, (laughs) and my boyfriend who has more experience in this area is like, oh, those look like you're trying to prove something. Let me get real restraints. (laughs) This this is the one that actually worked. Because he's like, you're strong enough that if you really pulled on those, you could get out. Yeah, 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 the pink fuzzy one's not as effective, generally speaking. If it, uh, Mm -hmm. just for the folks at home, if it says for novelty use only on the side, that's not the toy for you. Yeah. Unless you're just looking for a novelty. Yeah, yeah. fair to say, fair, fair to, to say. say. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, in getting ready and, and thinking about like what was turning me on this week, mm-hmm. I, was, I was prepping all week for this show. I was reminiscing about uh, when this show first started. You were on mm-hmm. the very first episode oh, uh, yeah. that we did, like that we actually broadcast mm-hmm. out into the world. And uh, I found... A lot of incredible, cringeworthy content as I watched myself as a baby podcaster awkwardly stumbling around like a baby deer. Uh, and I'll tell you what's got me turned on is uh, this nice little clip I'd like to share with you. We've got a, a little bit of a game for you. Uh, I don't know if you feel ready and raring to go first, uh, but... We're gonna. You are our guest. I think he <laughs> Thank should. You, you think yes. the guest should always I, go first? Is that I, the plan? My body is prepared, and I consent to this sex game. Yeah. So we're gonna throw some uh, some slides up on the screen behind mm-hmm. you. You will be okay. blindfolded so as to avoid seeing said ah. screen. Oh, so those are for the audience, right? Okay. 
And uh, yeah, there is a, a word up top that we're looking for you to say out mm -hmm. loud, not knowing what it is. Megan's going to try to cue you on what that word is uh, without saying any of the words underneath it. And you'll notice uh. one of the words that we're not saying is sex. So, uh, <laughs> to Megan, to start off with, yes. uh, you can't say any of the words on the screen. You're oh trying boy. to get him to say the top word at the screen. And no no partial words. He's going to have a blindfold, mm -hmm. so there won't be any gestures. Right. Uh, but say the word is sext. Yeah. Sexual text message would be right out. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. If, uh, if it's not, we're going to keep track of uh, how many you get right over the course of two full minutes. Ooh. And uh, if you need to pass, go ahead and call it out. You got it worked out? You know what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. And time starts now. Okay. Two parts. Uh, mm -hmm. First part, um, wind. Um, Blowjob. Wow. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, uh, we did a news story about this, and you shouldn't reuse them. Condom. Wow. Um, um, getting a little spicy. My oh, son of a bitch. Um, uh, okay, Lube. first, first, <laughs> <laughs> first word is um, you touch a stove, you say ouch. Hot. And second word is um, a person that you're married to. Side, the other side of um, marital bliss. Divorce? <laughs> <laughs> the, the, no. Uh, uh, you said the first word. What's the first word? Hot. Uh huh. Wife. Okay, yeah, there, there you go. go. Yeah. Okay. And what did you just shout out? Uh, but was completely not the word? unprompted, by the way. Uh, divorce? <laughs> no, before that. Uh, lube. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, what's it called if you? Want to have affection toward? You're in like like. Uh, with hot wife love. With, <laughs> with um oh I can't say that. Several. Se several yeah uh, you're not you're supposed to be hot, the I uh, I hate to see you flounder. <laughs> open open marriage. Uh but when it's more loving than that. Oh. Polyamory. There you yeah. go. Uh, we said the word love. Well, all right. right. <laughs> love polyamory. All right. Are we on to the uh, uh, next next, next word? All right. Okay. Uh, New word. Ooh, I probably have several of these at home. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really loaded <laughs> okay. prompt. Orgasm. Um, well, those two. But um, oh oh oh. Nope. In the uh, in, in the drawer. And that'll be time. That's two minutes. Dildo. Yeah. Yeah. God damn it. Yeah. Wow, so That's, I'm so glad. I, I haven't seen that in yeah. since it came out. Yeah. There's like there's creature really stuff, but uh, there's also things where I'm just laughing at myself. I think of divorce before lube. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean everything about mm. that clip from the fact that uh it is a like we're doing a podcast mm -hmm. and we did a visual game where there oh, is like yeah. a screen involved. <laughs> so sorry for uh, the rebroadcast yeah. for all of our podcast listeners. Mm -hmm. Uh to the to the logo, to uh, you know, just oh, yeah. the the whole experience Unrefined. a little yes uh delightfully tacky as well mm -hmm. uh but uh yeah that's that's what got me revved up honestly just having you back here in the studio and uh and doing this uh this fine good work with us again well i'm i'm always happy to help yeah <laughs> well say that in there <laughs> some things haven't changed much just the, a single word prompting blowjob yeah it. right so <laughs> just it, ready for it you yeah, had yeah. that one already loaded uh yeah and so in honor of those like early days when I was first joining the ACA, I'm going to do something to you that you did to me, which is with basically very little, if any, notice, uh, rope you into the studio and just ask for your life story. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, how, how did you, you know, almost five years ago, how did you get mixed up with the nonprofits and the atheist community of Austin and Talk Heathen? And, you know, who are you? Where'd you come from? How are you mixed up in all this? Well, this is one type of revenge that I can get behind. Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, because you want, so it was uh, 2014 that I first really thought about, like, oh, what do I believe and why? Up until that point, I'd been raised 
sort of more than nominally uh, Episcopalian, but Episcopalian. Uh, my mother came from that tradition. My father came from uh, the Catholic tradition uh, and grew up around uh, a bunch of people that were Jewish. Um, he's told the joke, and this, this is a, a little saucy, but he told the joke, uh, you know, he had his children baptized Episcopalian rather than Catholic because he wanted them to make a bunch of money rather than a bunch of children. So that's the level of like the, the seriousness type of religion. and value sure. that was expressed over religion. And then there was a, a brief period of time where I got saved and was sort of leaning into like, oh, no, no, this is going to be the thing that I pursue with my... Is that an uh, evangelical saved or, or more of a Catholic evangelical, saved? E evangelical saved. I, I almost got Catholic saved, but they uh, messed it up at the end. Too much homework? Uh, <laughs> well, I went to Catholic school, and that had too much homework, and they really beat it out of you in Catholic school. <laughs> they do. Even, even when you're not taught by nuns, somehow they still, you know... Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, they, it, basically it's I needed a, a, a group of people to feel like I belonged with. Mm -hmm. And now I find that uh, here because in 2014, um, instead of trying to find this group or that group, and there's lots of hobbies as well, um, I really sat down and thought about what do I believe and why. And I watched stuff and, and read things that prompted me to really examine like, okay, well, I've, I'm baptized Episcopalian, I believe in this God, you know, but... Why do I hold the beliefs I hold? And are they justified? And you know, how can I seek truth? Um, and then it was actually kind of a, a really short, it was just 11 days of examining that before I went, oh, well, nothing that's been called God to me seems like it's you know, enough existent. And, it's, and then from there, one of the things that I saw that prompted me to think about it was content from the ACA. Mm -hmm. So I was aware from, of the ACA right away and then sort of started showing up and volunteering and found people that I belonged with, people that I shared, you know, somewhat a view of the world. Uh, atheists are a, a notoriously and accurately described as sometimes too diverse to work together. Um, but there's a certain sort of aspect, particularly then politics was really interesting and central where people are going, oh my God, you know, there's these institutions that are like super old school Christian that are trying to gain power. And then I, 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 kept coming back because I could see that it was helping people, mm -hmm. right? And the thing that kept me around was, like, getting emails from people. But particularly when I started, when I showed up on a show, of people writing in to say thank you. And I was like, oh, okay, well, if this is something that I can do, that I can do well, that helps people, then I want to do it. Um, and then since then, I've been hanging out uh, <laughs> here, more or less. And then uh, I suppose more specifically to... Um, to the content of this show, that's also sort of uh, correlated with a period of time where I felt more comfortable examining myself and like what I'm sexually attracted to, who I'm sexually attracted to, how I express those things. Um, so then I started watching even more porn, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, obsessively trying to organize and catalog it because uh, it was all about, you know, self-indulgence for me through that. I mean, that's that. it's less a... What I've got to now is less a part of my life story and more a part of my sex story, I guess. Um, but, yeah, and, and here I am, ready to talk more about it, all the sex in the world. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. Uh, I think regular listeners of this show might know this story, but I, I got roped into that mm -hmm. interview on uh, the nonprofits and had not like come out to my family as an atheist, hadn't really fully considered myself as an atheist. I was uh, talking to the ACA about maybe doing secular sexuality and sort of getting turned on to the idea of atheist activism and these things, uh, but was still, still on the fence about it, still nervous about like connecting my name with organized atheism in my career and all of these yeah. kinds of ideas. And we did that interview and I, I kind of forgot about it for a while. And we moved forward with secular sexuality and I started to like get into it. But I still like I wasn't a YouTube person mm. in a meaningful way. I hadn't found the ACA through those means. And I, I didn't have a YouTube account, I don't think, uh, before doing secular sexuality. And so when I was on YouTube and I see this like recommended video of me talking about my life, I was like, 
okay, and I, I watched a little bit, and I shared it to my Facebook thinking, like, nobody is going to watch this 30-minute long YouTube video. Like, people don't really do that. And then the next day, like, everything happened the way I expected. Like, I got, like, two likes, zero comments, like, no real interaction with the post. But then the messages started coming in. I started mm-hmm. getting all of this. Like, I had all of my siblings reach out to me. I had, yeah. like, several ex-girlfriends. I had an ex-wife reach out to me. All yeah. these people like, are you okay? Like, are the things that you believe all right? Mm-hmm. And I started to realize, like, just how powerful uh, this platform can be. I mean, YouTube, but really everything that the ACA has built, everything that exists in this studio and then, honestly, beyond this studio is we've expanded during COVID and all of those kinds of things. So I guess I, I need to take a moment and just thank you for that moment, for that experience. Yeah. Uh, it was nothing. I'm, I mean, you, you, uh, based on some of your phrasing earlier, I'm glad we turned you on to podcast uh-huh. before I jumped you and dragged you into a room. Um, not a good example. Starting to the same where the show. restraints came from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, uh, obviously you're welcome and, and thank you for what you do. I mean, part of... Uh, why it was so important and why I was so like, no, you're not escaping, um, is that this is like a really, really restricting thing that comes up a lot, not just in like the Christian tradition um, as practiced, but in all kinds of of, sec- of uh, religious contexts, because a lot of religion is tradition, and traditionally, sex, no, bad, mm-hmm. and then also, what's a kink? That's the tradition of yeah. religion. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that... Thank you for the work you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Thank you were you right back. <laughs> you were a, a real part of uh, this show getting started. And, you know, uh, like I remember you would come to all of the tapings early on. We'd go and grab a drink with a, a good group of folks right afterwards. What has your time in the ACA entailed? I mean, I know you've been involved with these different shows mm-hmm. and in the leadership and, and some of these things. Mm-hmm. What's your time like been here? Uh, what's your time li- here been like? Ugh. It's been uh, really good. So I, I always feel good when I can bring something, particularly to a group, whether it's a, a bottle of wine to dinner or just some uh, aspect of things that I can do or, or labor or whatever to, to donate. And I've donated a, a lot of time and some money um, to these things. And then also, like you said, there was sort of a, a transformational period in the way the ACA run. Yeah. It had been solid. They'd had uh, the atheist experience on the show for like 20 years. And when I showed up, there were two shows. And then, you know, not bragging or anything, but um, when I left, I think we still had nine, but we'd had up to 11 and some were coming and going. Yeah, there was this like and huge moment of expansion that kind of mm-hmm. roped me in and, and roped mm-hmm. Dan as well as a, a handful yeah. of other folks that are, are still around. Yeah. I like to think that one of the things that I was able to, to contribute to is the, like the building of a of a larger community because it was mm-hmm. a very tightly knit group of friends that got this started and you know we're, we're grateful for for all the work that was done i am before i got here and i'm sure you are as well but they hadn't done like hey community come hang out with all of us because they had their own lives and then stereotypes about atheists not being good joiners sure yeah are are, are true there's a there's a you know a kernel uh, to well, it for sure there's a kernel to it you know um and really, uh, you know, trying to open the doors, making the library a public community space, um, are really some of the things I'm most I'm most proud of that I that I brought here. Mm-hmm. Um, and wh- whether it was, you know, ethically dragging you into a show um, <laughs> or, uh, and getting that started, and just like we had, I, I saw that the opportunity was there, and I knew that if we could get particularly more people in the door, the people were excited to volunteer. I knew I wasn't the only one that went, you know what, if I could do something, I would to make this work more. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of loneliness and people that are, you know, their families in a religious tradition and they aren't anymore, or their sexuality doesn't mesh with their family's view. Um, And I like being able to help with that. And so my time at the ACA has been a whole lot of socializing, a whole lot of trying to get the, like, Hey, yes, we do shows, and you know, I'm, I'll I'll be all behind that. We've got more voices, more perspectives. Let's talk about sex, baby, that kind of thing. Um, but really, I liked being able to like. We've always had the bat cruise, and it's always been a big event. Mm-hmm. But we had something on Valentine's Day. We had like a 
Um, we were planning a like uh, anniversary of the founding of the organization. Just the community feel of it, because there's a lot of people that will leave a religion and they'll want to find a community like that. But finding just the right amount of how much tradition do we borrow from traditional faith? Mm, do we mm -hmm. light candles? Do we not? Because some people, the religious parts of religion are complete trauma, but the having people around that are like, you know, your people is like something that they need. Right. Yeah. So my, my, my time at the ACA is full of wonderful memories of working with volunteers and employees um, to make that happen, to make a community happen. So I'm not taking credit for everything, but basically... <laughs> just the good parts, just, the stuff you just like. Just the good parts, the parts <laughs> you like. Yeah, so the fact that there's community, that's me. <laughs> um, there being more than... It was uh, already in Austin, and there were already <laughs> atheists, but <laughs> yeah, Jamie... <laughs> yeah, I, I opened the door, so all, everything that happened after people walked in, chiching, credit over here. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it, it's been uh, a heck of a journey. It's definitely had its ups and downs. I'm trying to get... Uh, Trying to do like a live show at the the uh, American Atheist Convention mm. was a real journey. I'm sure uh, Vern's got some more war stories about that than than I can. But it's been a really rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about uh, your experiences as an atheist and as a gay person. I mean, uh, how did you come out as either of those identities? Did you, did you post a video to Facebook and freak out your mother or was there uh, another strategy? Well, so when it, um, uh, well here, I'll do, I'll do, uh, I came out as gay first, mm -hmm. but I'll handle the atheist part uh, first because it's um, easier and simpler, which is I'd learned the sudden reveal and the big thing was going to maybe shock my parents. Mm -hmm. So there was like, um, I had a bracelet from the ACA. It was rainbow and it said Atheist Community of Austin. And so I sort of wore that. I did the like easing into it, coming out sort of story um, that, that people have done, but that I didn't do when it came to coming out gay. There's people that are like, oh, they're going to wear a pink shirt one day, but not bring it up and not talk about it. And then, oh, you know, they're going to, say that they want to learn to sew or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm, li I'm leaning on stereotypes here, but the types of things that parents see and think to themselves, oh, I think my child is gay, there's people that come out as gay by sort of like leaving the breadcrumbs there. Signaling that, yeah. yeah. I came out as atheist that way. Mm -hmm. um, and every now and then when I talk about charity or trying to find stuff, my parents say I'm very Christian, which is <laughs> fine. I know what they mean. But... Um, <laughs> It is, isn't it amazing I mean, how uh, religious folks tend to think that all goodness comes from their specific belief system, mm -hmm. and therefore, like anything that is good, just gets that label appended to it. Mm -hmm. Even a a president of the atheist community of Austin yeah. can be Christian if he is mm -hmm. nice enough. Kind of. I mean, I, you know, I have the advantage of you know the uh, they've seen and known me my whole life. Sure. So. Yeah. There's that. But, yeah, it's sort of like, okay, but if Christian to you means being a good person, then surely there are, like, Hindus and Muslims that are Christian. So it... Yeah, you know, I mean, it plays. I mean, yeah. it doesn't if you examine Except, it, well, but I, like, I take it. Yeah, yeah, like my parents weren't, weren't uh, are less concerned with the uh, theology mm -hmm. than with the, like, pathway through life. Um, so that's the, that's the atheist side of it. The gay side of it is I wasn't out to myself... Um, until I kissed a man on the face in college. And that, that was like first semester uh, freshman year. And then um, over the break when I came home, I was like, hey, you know, you've, you remember me talking about my friend? Well, he's not just my friend, he's my boyfriend. Um, and then there's a, if you did a word cloud of what their response was, there'd be a big word shocked and then a bunch of little ones around it. Because mm -hmm. apparently I wasn't gay enough for them to notice. Um, <laughs> You know, and I've, I've since corrected that. Um, <laughs> it's excellent little, work. Somebody's got to do it. Hey, that, that, I'm stealing that portmanteau. Um, but yeah, so, so for the uh, sexuality one, it was just sort of coming out as that. And then shocked response from my parents. Uh, they took, you know, a couple hours to figure it out. And my dad, who's a doctor, wanted to warn me that AIDS was bad. You know, it is. Don't have it. Avoiding it. Be safe. AIDS, that old, that old chestnut. Um, let's crack it together with science. But yeah, and then since then, it's sort of been a process. And now, you know, I've told them that I'm dating someone and that we're, you know, I'm, I'm 
got serious feelings about it, and now we're in a place where, you know, one, I'm comfortable with the world. You know, if you have a problem, then you have a problem, right? Sure. I mean, I'm not, you know, stripping in public or anything, but still, yeah, you, I have to live. You're your own person, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And then, um, I mean, I, like, I, I would dress differently walking down the street during a pride parade than to go, you know, to the post office. Business meeting, yeah. Yeah, I was like... I've n I don't remember the last time I went to a post office, but I needed normal place. <laughs> um, <laughs> the least sexual location I could think of, post office. The only uniform that isn't actually appealing to anyone. I uh, don't know, those well, khaki shorts. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> shorts. Um, but uh, where was I? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's in a place where I'm comfortable, and then I think that's really helped because now I can explore, like, parts of my... Uh, sexuality that are like, mm. kinky and stuff that I'd only <laughs> been able to like find any hint of through pornography and then now being able to look at pornography and be like not only is this like th this isn't just some ethereal concept in my mind it feels different and like I, I experience the porn differently because oh I've done that right now. sure and so it's yeah it's been a journey and then one of the things that's interesting um, I didn't think to ask you about this, but mm. in my mind, I'm like, oh, expert, cool. I get to ask questions <laughs> back. Um, after I came out and could be honest with myself, I realized, like, oh, I had a crush on this 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 boy in high school. Mm -hmm. And then also, oh, right, I now remember coming out to a friend of mine in high school, but then, like, my brain making me forget. Locking that shit down. Yeah, yeah. which made me go, wow, I am so good at lying to myself. Yeah. How yeah. can I believe anything is true? Um, because I want to. Uh, but yeah, and uh, here I am now with with uh, more more questions and more sure. things to share. But mostly, is that like something that's common? If someone's really in the closet, not being able to remember. Yeah, yeah, no, no question. I mean, okay. uh, the the memory wars. If we want to talk about <laughs> the uh, the psychological debates, those wars have been raging for decades and are, are far from being settled. We uh, hear all kinds of strange stories about recovered memories, and we recognize that a lot of these so-called recovered memories can be implanted memories, and there's a, a lot of messiness there. But just to say, don't believe everything you think. Like, don't yeah. trust your own recollection mm -hmm. uh, without some sort of outside evidence because mm -hmm. brains are messy. I mean, they are uh, fatty computers, and that's a remarkable thing, mm -hmm. but we should keep it in perspective. Yeah. You trying to say my brain's fat? Something <laughs> like that. Yeah. P-H-A-T? No, we're not doing that. We're moving on. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you missed out on the cheese from the 90s. No. Um, but, yeah. Uh, I, I hope that answers, I don't know, most of your yeah. question. Or... Well, so uh, a lot of what this show is meant to do is mm -hmm. recognize the experiences of people who are coming out of religion and then feel kind of behind. Right? Mm -hmm. Like they just didn't necessarily have like those experiences. Yeah. yeah so I, I wanted to ask I mean, it's 2022, so mm -hmm. I don't want to make it seem like we're going to have an interview with a real life gay. And, you know, I don't yeah. want to make it seem like this mm -hmm. is some sort of bizarrely unique experience, mm -hmm. but I am really interested to know as somebody who has been invested in the atheist community mm -hmm. and in the ACA culture mm -hmm. online and writ large in a lot of ways for a long time. What do you suppose the straights don't necessarily understand about yeah. uh, about being gay in the atheist yeah. community? Um, well, it's it's interesting because there's this stereotype that definitely has some uh, meat on it that there's like a level of seriousness being taken for like a what's your star sign and that being not just like a thing that you share in a relationship, but there's people that are like, oh no, I can't date him we're not compatible star signs, mm. which seems restrictive to me. But there's stuff like that, and there's, you know, a whole lot of spirituality. I know, like, socially and culturally, it's something that happens when you have a previous sort of religious structure that's less important now. So it used to be everyone was Christian, and now people can find their own way. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for my birthday, I got given a uh, deck of um, Britney Spears uh, tarot cards. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Oracle Britney. Um, and made me realize that I don't know her career well enough to fully uh, <laughs> reap the the the, the benefit uh, of it, which for me is sort of like a fun mental exercise and a way to examine my brain. 
But there's a lot of things like that where it's like um, there's a lot of religious uh, sentiments and like people reconnecting with their church um, uh, that are gay. And so most, I mean, most gay people are not atheist and most uh, people are not gay. So it's like an even narrower, I mean, theoretically, uh, dating pool. Obviously, I don't, you know, restrict myself to that dating pool, but there's a lot of that, and then it can be, you know, all of all of the things that you would expect between uh, straight people and gay people. I'm sorry, between a straight couple, you get uh, with a gay couple if one is a believer and one's not. Mm, sure. Um, but I feel like, and I've heard this before, that there's a lot of straight people that just assume that, you know, oh, there must be no believers that are gay because the church disapproves. But that's not really how belonging to a group works. Yeah, no, so that's fair that. to say. And then people, even now, underestimate, at least based on my experiences, um, oh God, I'm gonna get like canceled for this, the amount of pros promiscuity that can be easily found as a gay man. Mm, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, I had to explain to someone that on Grindr, you don't have to put your name, and <laughs> I don't know uh, of anyone. I, I don't think I've seen anyone's name on Grindr at all. Um, that's like, <laughs> it's also not the first thing that comes up when you start talking to someone. Um, this will be an episode I don't show my mom, but... Yeah, fair, <laughs> fair to say, but uh, no, I, I get it. I think that that is something that uh, a lot of people overlook, and we're, we're going to get, I think, a little bit more into some of the, the broad strokes, if we can, mm -hmm. of, of gay culture and, and what it was like mm -hmm. to sort of jump into those things. Uh, but I, I do want to remind people that they can call in. We'd love to hear from you at 512-991-9242. But in the meantime, I wanted to very quickly pivot to a uh, question that came in in the chat that feels really important here. Uh, they're asking, what does it mean to not be out to yourself? Uh, and the, the follow-up oh. is like, is, does that mean being in denial of being gay? And there is this sort of notion that uh, most gay people have always known that they're gay. Uh, that certainly wasn't my experience, yeah. but I, I'm interested to hear yours. Yeah, so there's, there's definitely a lot of people that no, from like a young age that mm -hmm. they, right? Like people go, yeah, I was seven at a birthday party and I saw another boy and then I realized, which is completely foreign to me. Uh, it's, it's kind of like denial, but beyond the point, I hesitate to use the word because it um, ushers up this, this uh, idea of conflict in my mind. My mind just didn't have any acknowledgement of that whatsoever, mm -hmm. right? So, um, oh God, I haven't counted recently, but the, the number of girlfriends that I've had in uh, high school is numerous. I mean, you need two hands. Um, it's not my fault. They started it. Uh, they asked me out, so that's on them. Um, <laughs> and I didn't know. But uh, it, it's just complete and utter denial to the point where it's like I was tearful and confessed like, oh, I think I've got feelings for this one uh, you know, guy in our high school friend of mine that I'm coming out to, you know, this, and she reassures me that it's fine, and then we drive back to school because we left for lunch, and before we get to the first stop sign, my, I could, like, I, I remember the thought of thinking, oh, that just happened, and then it just slipping from my mind without me fully thinking or forming any real memory of yeah. it until now. So just complete and utter denial and suppression. Um, which I think is uh, possibly something that happens with a lot of people that are gay, but I've got other things bouncing around in my brain that are <laughs> atypical. Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely uh, true that when you are experiencing that kind of oppression, when it is, and I, I hate to use this term, but honestly, if it is, quote, inconvenient for you to have a particular belief or to have a particular piece of information in your life, it is very tempting to, like, block it out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is that denial component, but I think it's honestly true that people just don't necessarily know what their mm -hmm. sexuality is at an early age. Oftentimes there are exceptions to that, but it's not always the rule that you've been like hiding it mm -hmm. all along. And particularly when there are all of these oppressive forces that would keep you from asking these questions mm -hmm. about yourself, if nobody's even modeled for you that you have the opportunity or the right yeah. to ask that question. And uh, then if you are somebody who doesn't necessarily fall neatly into a specific box, 
that can be even more challenging. I mean, for myself, like, I think everybody who went to high school with me knew that, you know, the boy wasn't right. Like, there was something going on there. Right. But I also knew that I was attracted to women. And yeah. so the idea of, you know, since the only two options apparently were like correct and gay, and I knew that I liked women, gay didn't fit. So I guess I would just be right with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, once you start to recognize like, okay, that doesn't tell the whole story, more stuff starts to fall out of that pinata the more you hit it. And I, I guess we see these movies about, uh, you know, people who have overcome great adversity to come out of the closet and become mm-hmm. icons. And there's this notion that, like, they've always known, they've always been at war with society. And I don't think that that represents the experiences of the vast majority of people in the queer community. Yeah, especially not now, because there's, there's been a lot of uh, positivity about it and acceptance it's sort of like, um, like right. Okay, so right now I have a job in the cannabis industry, mm-hmm. um, and basically there are friends of mine that have been like talking to me, like, "Oh yeah, no, my friend is in the cannabis industry now." And what they've learned, because they're very wholesome and they stay away from all of that, <laughs> is that uh, more than half the people they know smoke. It's and so I, I was thinking about it. I was like, why don't they have a coming out day for uh, pot smokers then? Yeah, because it's like the, the the coming out, the like, oh yeah, gay people are a thing. So that when I learn that about you know, my child or my friend, it's not a big deal. So the, there's a lot of people, particularly now, that are growing up in a world where there's at least enough acceptance that when they've got a bully at school or, you know, members of their family feel some type of way, for a lot of people, there's, there's community and there's some amount of that. You're always going to care what your parents say um, or at least be prone to it. Programming from a young age, womp. But... Um, Yeah, it's a lot better. I think I mentioned before the show, um, my boyfriend uh, has introduced me to what, like, basically rock in the vein of, like, Bowling for Soup or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just gay as shit, if I can say that without (laughs) getting canceled. Where it's, like, seeing about, like, oh, I need a strong man to hold me down and come inside of me. And that's, like, the refrain. (laughs) Inside We're we're not just sneaking that lyric in. Yeah, Yeah. it's just, like, the whole song. And, like, thinking about what it would have been like to grow up thinking or, like, even to be slightly out to myself and hear that, I, I probably would have realized before I was like, oh, I'm kissing a man on the face. That's when my mind went, all right, we can't really lie to ourselves anymore. Mm-hmm. You're, just, you're kissing a dude. What do you call that? Um, is basically what happened. And yeah, it, it's, it's amazing to see and almost incomprehensible, but I'm happy to watch. <laughs> Well, fair enough. Uh, We do hope that folks will give us a call here in just a moment. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've got a lot more to talk to you about, uh, but first let's take a look at what's been going on around the rest of the ACA. For lack of a better word, human history is deeply penetrated with (laughs) kink and with weirdness and with with sex just purely for pleasure. Um, And we can't get away from that. And we can't pretend like there's a normal way to do things because there just isn't. So I don't I don't think that fear is uh, is faith. And so I think it's good to not be afraid. I don't want to be controlled with fear. Do you? No, I do not. Okay. So, so you ready to be an atheist? <laughs> we so come together you, against the monarchy. <laughs> we come together against the monarchy. What We've a been fitting very British, to end. haven't we? We've been very British with each other. <laughs> <laughs> but to, so to everyone, so to everyone else out there, yeah. this is how Brits really behave. Yeah. <laughs> It's the only show, and I will never get ever get tired of saying this, that is worth watching at 3 p.m. Central on a Sunday afternoon. Get yourself over and watch the non-profits, uh, the first ever all British episode. You will not be disappointed. God's like, oh, well, how do I get glory? Oh, I make people suffer. But under your view, you've already admitted it's there's a logically possible world where God doesn't have to do that. And, and, and under your view, <laughs> his glory wouldn't be achieved? His glory wouldn't be achieved if there's not victims in it. That's your view. (laughs) 
Okay, well, I, uh, I've i mentioned on this show plenty of times before mm-hmm. that I was one of those people who didn't understand his own sexuality, who had not been taught mm-hmm. all of the options. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I'm now I'm a sex therapist, and I still don't even come yeah. close to knowing what all of the options are mm-hmm. because... Jesus, there's some great things out there. Mm-hmm. But uh, I I didn't go out on my like first real first date until I was 25. And oh, wow. there's a really steep learning curve mm-hmm. on a lot of these things. So for all of the, you know, uh, freshly out of the closet, freshly atheists, like ready to explore their life people out there, mm-hmm. I wanted to just kind of pick your brain and, and learn a little bit about some of your experiences mm-hmm. and, I don't know, maybe some some tips that you might be able mm-hmm. to whisper uh, and some ideas that you might be able to share for mm-hmm. people who are perhaps anxious about jumping into some of this world. Yeah. Well, I would say um, uh, uh, sex is uh, about how you feel, right? So pay attention to your own feelings. And then... Mm-hmm not an expert, can't give super general advice, but I can say what's worked for me, which is uh, exploring what I'm interested in by uh, finding the concepts on my own, although that's the way I like to learn uh, to do most things and to learn about most things, is undirected at least at first, get like a basic idea, and then, you know, if it's a technical subject, find someone that can explain how a logarithm actually works and what it means. <laughs> um, and all that, but for me, por- pornography has been pornography is great, um, and uh, that's been my <laughs> my experience. Uh, and then figure out the things that you like. And for me, journaling is very important. I like to have a record of something. It almost feels like it didn't happen. You know, pics or it didn't happen is almost a, a feeling for me. And I've been able to sort of document and figure out. Oh, here's this thing that initially I was entirely uncomfortable with. Um, but then, particularly because I've like bookmarked that video later, <laughs> so sometimes months, sometimes like a year and a half, sometimes a couple weeks later, I'll come back to it and I'll go, oh, okay, I'm more comfortable with that now. Because mm-hmm. there, there are people who um, at one point in time have uh, ranted and raved about homosexuality as bestiality and it's a sin. Right. They're given over to a reprobate mind. And now... I mean, I don't, I don't know how crude the jokes you want here are, but instead of those words coming out of their mouth, there's a penis going into it, and they're happy. Mm-hmm. So it, you, you'd be surprised at how much you can learn about yourself that you wouldn't have had a clue. And that seems like this like weird, open, scary thing, but if you have an Internet device and a locked door, um, there's, there's no limits. Do what you feel comfortable with, and then something that's worked particularly well for me is look at things that are like on the verge or look at things to see if you like them not necessarily in the moment immediately before you wank it because that's going to be a slightly different uh, so do do research uh, even without the like oh I need to get off right now (laughs) feeling Um, and then for me because I'm like not quite obsessive compulsive disorder just have some obsessive Mm -hmm keeping too many things, random disorganized files. Um, I have, like, playlists of different things, so I've got an account on most uh, porn sites. Genres and things, yeah. Yeah, free, but, like, just so that I can, like, bookmark things and go back to them. You are trying to learn about a person as much as you can, and learning about yourself and figuring out ways for you to figure out yourself is going to help you figure out your partner eventually. And it's also going to help you communicate to your partner because you can't communicate what you need. It's hard, nigh impossible to to figure it out Uh, or for for your partner in a a moment to figure it out. Yeah, be able to communicate around your sexuality. Let go of some of that shame. Like just be open about these things. I, Mm -hmm. I definitely hear that. Uh, there, there are a whole bunch of particulars that I want to mm. get into and, and hear okay. about your experiences with this and this and some of those, uh, you know, maybe stereotypical or, or perhaps less stereotypical mm. aspects of gay culture. But uh, first, I want to touch base with uh, Stephen in Arizona, mm. who wants to talk about, I guess, the continuing evolution of sexuality. Uh, Stephen, what's on your mind? Hi, guys. I, um, I'm a member of Gen X. And when I grew up, it was a lot like uh, what Christy was describing a few minutes ago about correct or gay. 
and that was pretty much all you had. And because of the time period when I grew up, uh, we were also dealing with HIV AIDS a lot more prevalently. Uh, and society as a whole, I would describe as a lot more hostile. So mm -hmm. coming to terms with your sexuality as a non-straight person, for, for lack of a better description, was already problematic. But then it was figuring out where you were on the spectrum. And I remember just to really date myself in college, there was uh, some kind of, of sexuality conference or convention at a neighboring university. And I went to a small private Methodist college that wrote us up in the school paper because there were five of us <laughs> who went who were non-straights as representatives of our school. Sounds so it was hard. a really big deal uh, to be outed in the paper. Um, but also I was the lone bisexual. And it was interesting because, uh, you know, for me, it was, you know, once I learned that word, it was for me, I liked both. And as time has gone on, there have been other terms like they coined at that point uh, ambisexual, mm -hmm. which meant you were more fluid in your sexuality in terms of this person who came up with that word, but that word didn't stick. And I tend to now classify myself as pansexual, although for people who don't know what that means, I will go back to bisexual because that's easier for them to get their head around. Um, or at least cover some of the bases. Right. But mm -hmm. where I'm going with all of this is, you know, in the in recent years, and I, I joke about it a lot because I deal with uh, the Gen Zers or whatever the youngest cohort is now called, um, and some of these new terms that come out like demisexual uh, alongside of your sexuality and the whole non-binary asexual gender fluidity, all of these terms and concepts that have come in the last 15 to 20 years, really, we didn't have those terms mm -hmm. going back 30 years ago or, or further. Um, you know, I've, I'm old, so I can go back further. But it's, it's interesting to me that it feels like sexuality is almost in some ways becoming, because we have so many words, you can continually come out as you learn a new term or you're we're still fine tuning the knob oh you don't use knobs anymore we're still fine tuning the signal and we're still uh coming up mm -hmm. with new words to describe ourselves and and on the one hand i think that's great on the other hand i feel like it's also niching us a little bit mm -hmm. uh like i i've learned the word pansexual and i understand what it means and what it means to me i haven't met other pansexuals and I'm in my 50s. So I tend to go back, as I said, to bisexual to even find a cohort. And there are still barriers between the various letters in the LGBTQIA plus family, uh, where bisexuals, whether it's a, a pit stop on the way to gay town, uh, which I can say it's not after being this way for my whole life. Uh, you know, what non-binary means, what it means to the rest of the community. Uh, the, and as we get into, and I, I've discussed or mentioned this before with Christy, the differences between sex and gender and sexuality and how all of these things play together. So um, that was what I wanted to say. And I wondered, a uh, millennial person, Mr. Boone, uh, how you feel about that? As uh, You're not that much younger than me, but you are technically a different cohort. Do you feel that change and that sort of niching going on as well? And how do you feel like it affects the discussion between all of us? So uh, I'm glad you asked this question because, it, because it's not something that I want to change, but it's definitely something beyond what I embrace. So for me, I'm very happy with the word queer. Um, I, I'm, more, I'm more comfortable with the word faggot than I probably should be. Um, reclaimed. I, I officially reclaim it. I reclaim this word for myself. Faggot. Okay. Um, so those two. In part because um, my outlook is to try and make myself be open-minded. And for the first, actually for a majority of my life still, uh, if you count the years when I was a child, um, I would have said I was straight and I was wrong. So if I then go to a specific word now, then in, in my mind, I'm like, okay, well, 
are you certain that that's the end of it? Mm. You know, uh, so queer to me is is all encompassing. It has that like non-specific tone to it. And then you know, I'm wearing this shirt because my favorite color is pink. Um, so there's a little bit of that aspect to it. But mostly, I think you're really you 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 make a good point that isn't often pointed out, which is it makes things niche. And then having separate flags. I'm all, I'm a big fan of flags. I'm a flag nerd. But I think adding on to that nicheness is having a separate flag for pansexual and a separate flag for bisexual and a separate flag for these. So it definitely feels more niche. And initially, my reaction was like, okay, guys, stop. What are you doing? But I realized that part of that is people finding the way and helping each other find ways of expressing and defining themselves, or at least uh, expressing and explaining themselves. And I'm all in favor of that. Um, I don't get too specific into it because I realized that if I'd been born a couple decades earlier, I would have been a flower child, um, hippying it up with the best of them. Um, but yeah, I I think that I have the same view of it that you do, which is it's really good, but you know, there's limits to the degree that I use specific labels like that. Yeah, I mean, I think it is valuable in helping us to form communities so long as we aren't then turning around and choosing to use those communities as an exclusionary device, mm, right? Yeah. If we are expanding the tent and adding more and more poles to it and allowing people to gather around the bear flag and the, you know, mm. grayscale flag and the uh, demigirl flag and, and all of these different ideas, then fantastic because now you can find people who are into the thing that you're into and that's mm -hmm. kind of the amazing power of the internet if we really want to put a label on it like mm -hmm. you don't have to watch the three shows that are on the three networks you can watch the most bizarre game shows from a country whose language you don't speak at any hours of the night you can watch mm -hmm. all kinds of sports that I've never even heard of and I, I find real value in all of that stuff but when it starts to lead us to conflict, when it starts mm -hmm. to lead us to uh, saying, well, no, once you've identified as this, you're stuck as that, mm -hmm. that's where we're really missing it, Stephen. So that idea that you're kind of coming out for the rest of your life, I, I do think that there is value in that notion because as much as we draw these lines and create these categories, the truth is these categories are just things that exist in our imagination. Yeah. They are constructs that we've developed mm -hmm. and they have value, but they're not like real in a look at them under a microscope kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so if we recognize that they're effectively arbitrary, we can use them to have fun and to paint with, mm -hmm. but we don't need to use them to form walls with. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And I know that we've been talking over our, our uh, uh, caller a lot, but I just want to say, yeah, it's it's real in the way that Christmas is real. Christmas is mm -hmm. on December 25th because that's when we do it. There's nothing, well, okay. Not to, not to well, I, this is this is the right show talking about sex to, <laughs> to ignore the, the religious significance, but um, it, I could enjoy Christmas if it was celebrated in January or in March um, as long as it uh, ended its illegal occupation of November, then I'd still be able to <laughs> to, to satisfy it as far as the uh, uh, Christmas wars go. But yeah, it's as long as, like you said, you know, it's not something that's divisive. Because right now, not to sound like every pundit ever, but we need unity, mm. which is why. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that uh, touches on what you were trying to ask about, Stephen. Yeah, no, it wasn't. It it. Yes, you, you were fine. Um, and it's it's interesting you talk about uh, queer and faggot and so forth. Faggot, I remember a movement in the early aughts um, mm. about that, and that was very heated as to whether we could reclaim that term. And queer, for myself, I'm, I'm more comfortable with that to a point, but there's still a twinge mm -hmm. because it was used against me as a derogatory um, along with faggot. Faggot, also when you learn more about English and you speak other languages, faggot bothers me less than queer. But I, the unity part is where I feel like we still run into, like for, for the children in the audience, lesbians and gays uh, historically didn't get along mm -hmm. on a lot of mm -hmm. things. They had very different, you know, le lesbians were very feminist. Uh, there were gays that, that hated, you know, had a, a misogynist streak. 
And then when AIDS came along, lesbians were our nurses. Mm. And that really united the community around that. And I feel like I'm not sure where things go now. I worry about the disunity in the community. I know personally just about one representative of every letter in our in our LGBTQ mm-hmm. alphabet, um, except maybe intersex because no one's come out to me as intersex. But among the rest of the letters and things, I, I know at least one person. And there is still, I find, trans bias, which bothers me greatly. And what I what I feel like, whether it's our letters of the alphabet or the straight people in our audience listening now or not, that it it isn't a question to to Christie's point, these are the colors that we paint with, that we're all different. But the basic human feelings of compassion, of empathy, of kindness need to be extended to everyone, regardless of of how you may identify yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the idea of equal rights to everyone needs to, I mean, that's my politics, but I also just think it's being a good person and a normal person. And that's where I worry. I know people in the, in the greater community who are rabidly transphobic and feel like they don't belong under this umbrella that the asexuals don't belong under our umbrella for some bizarre reason. And there are still little teeny pockets of L's who don't like G's or both of those who don't like B's. And it's like, what are you doing? Have you learned nothing? Mm -hmm. And some of them, in fairness, like I said, I'm old. Some of them are baby gays for, for just a fun term that don't know any better and don't didn't live the history necessarily to see what we've gone through. And that's kind of what I worry about. I, you know, there are a lot of jokes about the kids who come out in middle school now and they're coming out is like nothing compared to what coming out was during the Reagan administration. That mm-hmm. you don't know what we went through to get to the point that you can come out in middle school and get support. So, you know, stop, you know, coming out of the closet and blowing the door off and redecorating the room you're able to do that because somebody did that for you 30 years ago and set it up. And I, you know, I've talked before a lot about, you know, talking about support. The majority of my friends, because I I refigured it the other day, the majority of my friends who have non-hetero kids send them to me to talk to after their kids come out and they say, I don't know how to talk to my kid about X. And it's like, well, I don't know everything, but okay. And I, you know, I, that's where I'm learning all these new words and things, but that, that's what that led to is us being out 30 years ago led to their parents being more gentle with their kids. But somewhere along the way, we've still lost, I like, I don't understand certain part of the political spectrum and I don't understand certain parts of our community where there's still those walls going up. And it isn't so much a question, it's just a statement for the audience as well. Yeah. That that's still something we have to remember, that we're all in this together. We None of us get out alive. There's no reason that we can't be kind to each other and offer equality to each other. And whether you understand why someone describes themselves a, per, pers- a specific way or with a particular letter doesn't mean that they're not entitled to support and the right to exist in the world. And mm-hmm. that's all I had to say on that, because I knew you were waiting for a pontification. So <laughs> I gave you one. I agree. Um, the, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the, the metaphor you started with, with we all paint with the same colors, uh, can do uh, double the work, because what is the difference between this color and that color, right? We didn't have the word orange to describe the color until after we had the word orange to describe the orange. And most people now, and I do myself, I don't separate indigo from blue if I'm listing the colors of the rainbow. But mm-hmm. indigo is a different color. Uh, violet's a different color than well, plum. And so as you look closer yeah. at the wavelengths, you can find more colors. And as you Language look gives us that the, ability. Yeah, that the sexuality works the same way. The closer you look, the more you see. Although mo- a lot of really complicated things work that way. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like mm-hmm. there's something really missing. Like we need... Uh, 
you know, uh, this is me talking to my people now, although you're probably included too. I don't know. I mean, I'm um, just along for the yeah, ride. Yeah, I, that's, that's me a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, just some sort of like collection of stories. I mean, uh, it's not comparable at all, but people were worried in the Jewish community that Holocaust survivor stories weren't going to be around because the Holocaust happened a while ago and now Holocaust survivors are passing off passing on naturally. Well, I mean, I've never met anyone and they'd have to be, they'd have to be, they'd be old and probably not uh, very old at the time that was around or knew someone that was at, um, you know, any, Had any those first person experiences. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. like, they're, they're, our story started, our, our story started in the United States at the earliest in the 50s and things between the 50s and the 70s, uh, I don't really know that much about. Uh, Reagan didn't care. I know that. Uh, <laughs> reality TV helped Clinton be like, oh, it's sad that he died of AIDS that one time. Well, it's, it's kind but, of the theme of the episode that uh, we, we stand on the shoulders of the people that came mm -hmm. before us. So, Stephen, I, I appreciate you just kind of walking us through, uh, I guess, that cautionary tale of what it looks like mm -hmm. to, have the, to have the L's and the G's in opposition to one yeah. another and and let that be a i suppose a warning to all of our demi girls and cat boys and you know as we like mm -hmm. look more and more into the spectrum i think there's value in identifying the specificity and mm -hmm. recognizing our uniqueness yeah. but it only takes a five minute trip to the zoo to recognize that we have way more in common <laughs> than our differences yeah yeah I always say humans are pretty much all the same. Blah, 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 blah. You've got a face. It's the, you look exactly <laughs> the same as all the other humans to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's just yeah. the tiniest differences. So, Stephen, we're going to grab the next call, but I mm -hmm. so appreciate you giving us a try. You have yeah. a great night. Thanks for calling in. My pleasure. You too. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. All right, so let's talk to uh, Whisper in Utah, who has uh, some interest in purity culture. Uh, mm -hmm. Whisper, what's on your mind tonight? Hi, so here's my thing. Um, purity culture often delays um, realization of sexuality. And who are you telling? You are, I know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, let's say you are um, agender or asexual. You don't have those feelings of gender to realize that you are, in fact, not having a gender. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. even worse because that sort of thing is so repressed in purity cultures. So it's very um, common. Uh, like, repression is just common. You just think it's normal to um, not have any connection. But then when you get later out and uh, learn more about things, you start to realize, hey, wait a second my disconnection to a gender is not exactly normal. Everybody else knows they're male or knows they're female or knows they're trans or knows that they like pe likes people of a certain type or if you're um, asexual, you just realize, you just think that not having feelings is normal because that's what you've been told all the time. Yeah, fair to say. Yeah. I would say, yeah, there's definitely a lot of, if you do something that prompts someone to think that there's a way that they should be or a way that they have to be, then you've given uh, the uh, uh, tremendously powerful ammunition to every to a whole series of cognitive biases, right? Like denial is often talked about as the first stage of grief. Well, grief is being told or learning something that's unpleasant or that doesn't match with your worldview, like being raised in a household where gay either wasn't mentioned or was, you know, people giving Demonized given over to or, a, yeah. a reprobate mind as an example where your mind would say, well, that's not me. And then if I feel a feeling that's like that, oh, the feeling must be wrong because I have the conclusion already. So it's the, yeah, it, it really does. And uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> That, that was certainly yep. my experience, Whisper, uh, not having a, like being in a purity culture environment, not having the opportunity to even ask these questions. Uh, it took years and years for this stuff to finally force its way out to the surface. Uh, like we talked about at the beginning or in the middle of the show, that notion that you, uh, if you're queer or if you're anything other than like cishet that you've always known 
is, I think, based on the reality that cishet people are told that they're cishet at birth, whether it's explicitly or implicitly. Mm -hmm. And so because there's never any disagreement with that, there's the expectation that we should all have this, uh, like, obvious and easily distinguishable aspects of ourselves which is just not the case. I mean, I would be, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing as a therapist if people had that clear understanding of themselves. And purity culture is certainly a system of oppression to keep that knowledge from us in in many many ways. Yeah, I didn't even realize that this was even an option to be queer until I started interacting with other queer people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So well, find I your community. Happy to interact. Yeah. No. Thank um, you for for joining us for being yeah. a part of our very very ever growing umbrella. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we move on with the rest of the show, is there anything else you want to touch on tonight? Um. No. That's it. But thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. Yeah. You have Thanks a, a great night. Yeah. Good callers today. Like yeah, that. yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we do still have some time on the clock, and uh, there are so many aspects of oh, no. gay culture that I, I think that mm-hmm. these folks who are maybe finally able to ask these questions, finally able to mm-hmm. grab those words and to paint themselves in whatever color they need to, uh, may be still wondering about. So uh, I'm just kind of throw some of these at you and let you walk me through like what has your experience been what tips mm-hmm. can you give what does it look like for somebody who's maybe just getting started mm-hmm. and uh i can always give more than just the tip right yes. thank you uh you already touched a little bit on on grinder but i mm-hmm. think that that is a honestly a dangerous place for somebody who is maybe just starting to think could I possibly be maybe I want to explore Mm -hmm. maybe I'm still a little bit secretive about it and I I wanted to hear what what kind of tips do you have what kind of advice do you have for navigating grinder so uh, I've I've made uh, quite a few like oh wow looking back on it that was a very unnecessary high-risk behavior uh, I have like the sort of like, well, if you're going to drink, do it in the house kind of view of that. Obviously, uh, sexually transmitted diseases are a thing. There's so many ways that you can get prep for free, which is a way of um, uh, helping yourself prevent uh, help. It, it helps to prevent you from uh, contracting AIDS, even if you're exposed to HIV with 99 percent effectiveness and you can get it for free. Um, it's once daily pill, I'm on that. But basically, I would say um, the biggest safety thing that I've done, um, I'm doing fewer random hookups now because I have a boyfriend and we're in love. Ah. Um, love is easy, just be honest. Um, but sex <laughs> can be complicated and tricky. Sure, <laughs> sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, just summed up the whole mission of the show. <laughs> like, love is easy, sex, just be honest. Yeah, yeah. And scene. And scene. Well, I mean, it can be tricky to communicate your feelings, too. That's why you have a, you have a job, communicating feelings around sex. But um, I can tell you there's, some, there's at least one other person out there that's going to be, you know, I don't mean to overpromise for the world, but there's going to be like a perfect <laughs> puzzle piece fit is what I've found for myself. But with Grindr, there's a lot of things where it's like, oh, wow, this is something that a lot of men use when they're like, wow, I'm really horny. I want to have sex right now. So you'll get like conversations that start where they'll be like, here's a pic of me, pic of you, and then after that, they'll block you and they'll move on. And it's either because they came or they just wanted a photo. Um, I think I did that once when I was starting off. I mean, I didn't do that to steal a photo, but it was because I had gotten horny and I was messaging multiple people like, okay, is there a way to safely meet up with someone? And there's that. But yeah, it's... So just kind of expect it to be like a very, you know, like on the stock exchange kind of conversation. (laughs) A little bit, yeah. Uh, It'll be on the stock exchange. In Austin in particular, there's a a real shortage of tops. So, uh, you know... The world is bottom heavy. It always has been. (laughs) Yeah, that fat old Australia. Um, But yeah, I mean, take necessary precautions. One thing that I would always do particularly the first time that I met up with someone, um, would be I'd have a friend that I'd tell where I was going, and then when I got there, that I was there, and then I'd, like, screenshot messages. And basically I was like, okay, so I've done what I need to to try and make this safe, 
But, you know, if they pull something, at least my friends can, can get them thrown in jail. So that was my, like, precaution. And as long as everyone knows that that's a thing that happens, it works as a deterrent as well. But there's a lot of parts, particularly, I think, in uh, uh, gay culture for men. I'm not a lesbian, so I don't know. But mm -hmm. for gay culture for men, that's like there's a lot of parts of cruising culture, which is just having a random place where you go and hook up with random dudes more often than not anonymously. Um, they can be really risky, uh, but you know, men are still going to do that. There's a lot of sexuality that drives that way. So I'd say uh, be safe and then don't be hesitant to communicate your needs. Uh, personally, if I met, you know, was going to hook up with someone from Grinder, and you know, things kicked off and it's all kisses and sex, and then something was going that was uncomfortable for them. And they, I, I would want them to, I would rather have them be like, no, this is the worst thing ever, and then storm out in the most, you know, sexually off-putting way, than just grin and bear it. Mm. And particularly if they're exploring their sexuality for the first time. I don't want to be the, like, well, I was too nervous to tell him to stop experience, because I've had that experience. I hooked yeah. up with someone, and I had filters on that limited age, and this person was very clearly, like, a couple decades over... Lying about uh, Lying about they their were. age, yeah. and then... Uh, in the entirety of that experience, no words were exchanged. Um, I met at their house, which is also like, okay, it's it's safer if you share their address, but it's also, you know, home field advantage for them if you're sure. thinking safety-wise. And then it, I just felt nervous and, like, off-put that I was there and they had lied uh, about their age. And then I just sort of, like, uh, it's, okay, I... It, Life is very different for women, but it reminded me, my experience reminded me of the types of experiences that I'd heard women describe as commonplace of like, well, I felt pressured and uncomfortable basically expressing my needs or expressing my hesitation, mm -hmm. so I didn't. And then something happened or like, okay, you know, uh, grin and bear it or like lay back and try and find some way of enjoy it. But that, that's, that's something that I would say honest, sincere communication if you're hooking up with someone, bring or if some you're dating assertiveness someone, to the conversation. Be, bring some assertiveness because your needs are at least equally important in that moment as theirs, um, and your comfort at least equally as important. But in some situations where it's like you're uh, <laughs> that I have, may have more personal experience with, but where you're bound or in a in a normally uncomfortable situation, or there's other. Um, restraints or there's you know things that are happening that limit your ability to uh, uh, breathe somewhat or whatever because you know occupied um, uh, where it can be more important for you to communicate that because a person mm -hmm. who's not in a m more compromising situation sexually needs to be aware of that yeah right it's easier to bruise you know uh, well actually I don't know if it's easier to bruise bru I was gonna say it's easier to bru bruise an ass than a dick and I was like well Dicks are pretty sensitive too, but basically, basically, be assertive, and then even if you're uncertain and you're like, "Well, I'm not certain about that," assert yourself. Don't hesitate. And then, if someone really has a problem with what you've communicated or how you've communicated, it's better that you have an awkward communication that doesn't end with you feeling forced to do something sexual that you don't mm -hmm. want to. There are other hookups like, in the sea. Like there's even other if you hookups in the quote, sea, ruin there's, this experience, like a, better yeah. to ruin it than to be miserable during it. Yeah. To have it ruined. Yeah. And then there's lots of um, like gay friendships that start but between men with a hookup and then, oh, you know, what are we gonna be? Or like there's a hookup and then like and then after that, pillow talk a conversation and then either like anime or video games or whatever, and then you find your bro. Um, so I'd say Explore it, uh, be safe, and then, you know, one of the things that's been really helpful that it's taken me a really long time to get to is never had any gay friends, not really. I mean, I was friends with people that I was dating, but I never had, like, you know, my boys. Sure. My gay boys hanging around, um, talking about dicks and stuff, um, until recently, uh, until I started finding people and, you know, befriending people through hookups and stuff, so... I've lost a little bit of the framing of the original question um, <laughs> because I do like to talk and share yeah, well, and like the sound of my own voice. I mean, just talk to me a little bit about how uh, gay hookup culture differs maybe from what we see in the media. I mean, we don't have to do a, oh, a deep yeah. dive analysis I, here, but I, 
for somebody whose only experience of it has been through TV yeah. and through these different things, how can you prepare them? Um, uh, you're definitely going to run into some things that are more blunt in terms of what people want, particularly mm -hmm. on Grinder. There's a lot of people that just are li like... Um, the dance and nuance it, that you yeah. see on OKC does yeah. not apply on Grinder. <laughs> can confirm. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, like, because... Uh, Okay, keep it as like a dating site, mm -hmm. right? And people go, "Oh, Grinder, it's uh, Tinder for gay people." It's like, well, eh. that's almost offensive, but <laughs> I understand I mean, that you don't understand because it's like I think there's no names. Uh, I, I'm, you know, maybe one in fifteen or twenty profiles will have a person's face, like an actual name yeah. and face. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, just face. Their their name won't be there because uh, it's, it's hooks up. It'll tell you, "Oh, you're online now." This person, they've got a little green dot, so they're online. They're this many feet or miles away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it lags a little bit so that you can't triangulate, but it's basically like, oh, this person is walking distance away. This person is driving distance away. Mm -hmm. It's basically an app that facilitates, like, a man gets home at the end of the work, stereotypes, I know, and it's like, oh, man, the first thing I want to do is, is, like, you know, wank. Get this. off with somebody. Oh, I don't have to. I'll use Grinder. I can find someone. Yeah. So it's like, it's a very good casual sex minder. And then. I think I, I, I I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, the statistic I saw is that on uh, OKC, uh, eHarmony, and, uh, and one other, when you aggregate it, uh, it's something like three days, uh, three to seven days is typical between when you first match with somebody versus when you actually meet up with them. Mm -hmm. Grinder, it's probably closer to 30 minutes. Fair so to say? From, from when you like see each other. First connect with somebody to when you actually say, like join yeah, up. Uh, yeah. It's, That's uh, the expectation equivalent anyway. Equivalent to three to seven minutes plus drive time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Uh, they might as well call it gay sluts, but that's too direct. Hey, well, you know, it works, yeah, yeah. though. It's not too direct for Grinder because there's people <laughs> that have said that, and then there's lots of different ways to describe yourself in emojis. One of the people that I ended up meeting through a hookup, then we're really close friends now, um, when we met, we met through Grinder. his profile was just an emoji of a rooster and then emoji of a lollipop, and that was it. I think and I then, got it. Yeah, and then basic things like, Age, height, body type, uh, HIV status, um, tribes, like, oh, I'm a bear, I'm a twink. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's, that's it. So it's basically, like, it's, you, know how, you know how you always hear the like, terrible stories of like, oh, these dudes in high school, you know, Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook so he could rate how hot women were or whatever. <laughs> Imagine if instead of women, it was other men, and many of those men were wanted to know what their rating was. Mm -hmm. And you have Grinder, where it's like, yeah, it's more about the sex than the people <laughs> for, for a lot of it. But people do try and find friends. There's a, Oh, there's also, what are you looking for? And one of the mm. categories is right now. Um, <laughs> and that one's pretty much always on. Pretty, yeah. Always available, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so there are a lot of stereotypes and I think probably a lot of anxious hand-wringing for folks who are like mm -hmm. coming into these spaces around uh, around hygiene. I mean, I guess let's specifically talk about oh, douching. douching. Yeah. What is the expectation, I suppose? What should the expectation be? What's the conversation like? Mm -hmm. Obviously, individual experiences are going to be different, but mm -hmm. for somebody who's never interacted with the culture but wants to, how can you prepare them for that? Well, I don't no, un unless someone is into, like, scat as a kink, which is, like, playing with excrement, um, I don't know of anyone that wouldn't appreciate uh, douching. But in my time, uh, up until now, uh, I don't... Uh, I hadn't before a hookup. Um, I've only really started to learn to do how to do that recently. So a, a little yeah. bit of Santorum is kind of expected <laughs> and okay. Well, there's, a, there's a little bit of that, but there's also like... I'm going to let that... people Google that one, by the way. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a dance yeah. savagism. Oh, yeah. And then it's on... Um, you, can, you can see the definition on uh, 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 Urban Dictionary as well. No doubt. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I've recently spoken with a friend of mine who ran into this ex uh, expectation because he had no idea what he was coming to. He was fresh to the experience, uh, and then there was some uh, mess, you know, poop on the dick, as we say, uh, for, for the technical term. Um, and the person that he was hooking up with, like, I think for the, maybe for the first time, uh, just freaked out on him. So it was like a huge, scary impression. 
Um, I would say when it comes to sex, you are never obligated to do something that you're not comfortable with. And uh, it's trickier than you think uh, from personal experience, but having uh, experienced uh, having sex with someone that hasn't douched and having sex with someone that does douche I mean, we, or th that is douched, is douched is just better because there's less poop, but um, it hasn't <laughs> it hasn't stopped me from finishing. I, uh, you know, nothing that came out of my ass has stopped anyone else from from finishing. There's some like expectation, and some people are gonna like really freak out, like, oh my god, there's shit involved. I hate shit. You know, obviously, it it's gonna depend. I think more on how people feel about shit than how people feel about <laughs> sex. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it varies wildly. Sure, okay. Um, yeah. So there's so not, not a, a blanket expectation that people should walk in knowing, well, these are the rules to gay that I should be prepared oh. for. And, oh, like, yeah. this is, you know, yeah. rule number two and three. Yeah, and then... Um, one and two. Based, based on like the way you interact and advertise is what I call it, whether it's, you know, I'm wearing short shorts or messaging someone, <laughs> uh, is going to end up selecting for or like being a type of filter for the type of people you interact with. And then the more experiences you have, the more you'll learn and understand um, what you're doing and, and what you want. And then you'll, you'll meet different types of people that are sort of interested, not just in different positions, but in sort of different... Mm, relationship isn't quite the right word, but like ways of relating during sex. So not just dom sub or like top bottom, but there'll be people that'll have a particular thing that they want uh, you to call them or they'll want to call you. Um, it, it's, it's a real rainbow. There's not a specific set of rules, but I'd say being mindful of that and then, uh, you know, be safe, really. Like protect yourself from AIDS, uh, you know, be condom, uh, be condoms. <laughs> Have condoms, use condoms. Don't um, reuse them. As, don't as reuse noted condoms. Before. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then lube is great. Have lube. Do yeah. It makes makes yeah. everything smoother. Smoother operation. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a, a whole thesis that could be written around the different. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm gonna go with the term pet names, even though that is mm. the least appropriate way to describe <laughs> it. Uh, but but this idea of of daddy and and mm. pup and all of these kinds of terms that get thrown around. Talk to me about how that I guess works out or looks like in hookup culture, particularly. So people are gonna have. Uh, I mean. It's a, a, a diverse field. People are going to have different feelings about it. So the word daddy in particular, for the longest time, was like, don't say this. This mm -hmm. is very, uh, my father isn't here. What are you talking about? Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people like that. Um, however, uh, words like that and words like pup in particular, I'm a human. I'm not interested in, in being like a real like dog, right? Uh, there's a difference between gay and bestial, but no, no, no. It's a, it's a kink for people, and you know, I, I and, accept. You know, that. It, it's a yeah. valid kink. And, Your kink and, is oh, not it's my kink. Absolutely but, valid. I'm not yucking there, your yum. Right, but, but for, there is this thing in hookup culture, yeah. I, particularly like in the grinder community, okay. where there is sort of a like forced. You know, hey, I know we just met. Hey, I know we haven't really discussed, like, our kinks and unpacked all of this. Yeah. But I'm just going to kind of throw that at you. Or at least yeah. I think there's a, a there's, lot of conversation or stereotypes around that. Yeah. You you do get some stuff like that where, like, uh, so one of the first things would be like, oh, what are you looking for mm -hmm. in, a, in a message um, from someone on Grinder? Which, by the way, you don't have to match. You just send messages to whoever's online right. that hasn't blocked you. Um <laughs> And there's a, there's a lot of blocking. Like when you block someone, it's as if you vanish from the app for them. Um, but uh, what you uh, end up getting is people going like, "Oh, what are you looking for? Uh, just trying to get some head." Oh, that sounds perfect. And then you go, and so there's that limited sort of expectation, or at mm. least of where things are going to start. But where it goes from that, and then oh, I'm getting a blowjob can mean any number of like 27 different things at the top of my head, not bragging, <laughs> but like, oh, does that mean they want to like play in the car? They're trying to go there. Who's hosting? So you get fewer surprises than I think you would expect from like the straight hookup cult from the, the gay. Right. I see. You know, the, the straight up 
but like gay hookup culture, the straightforwardness of it. Um, but people are generally, in my experience, pretty respectful of that, particularly in the hookup culture because it's like someone's just thinking about right now. And then, you know, if you keep messaging each other or exchange phone numbers, there'll be more to it. But it took me like a, a, a while before the word daddy wasn't like taboo, you know, mm. off-putting way to me. I, I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I could honestly sit here and just sort of like lob gay stereotypes and like sort of these out there questions at you all night and get sort of your, your take and your experience. Mm. But I'm used to having things lobbed at me all night. Hey, oh. <laughs> uh, but as we, you know, get closer to the, the end of the evening, I guess I'm wondering uh, if there is anything that you want to make sure to touch on for, I guess I'm, I'm really imagining that like don't want to say 25 because I know lots of people will come out of religion when they're ready to come out of religion. Lots of people will come out to themselves as gay when they're ready to come out to themselves and people will start to explore these things at all kinds of different ages mm -hmm. and likely find information on YouTube about how do I do this? How do I gay? Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, what have we not hit on just in these last couple of minutes that feels really important to, to get out there into the world? Yeah. One of the things, uh, there's a couple things. Sure. So particularly because sex in general is taboo, just speaking as an American about American culture, mm -hmm. um, and it's taboo every, in most places that aren't France. Um, the, uh just remember that when you're learning about your sexuality, there's a part of it that's going to connect somewhat um, to uh, your feelings as well, just romantically, um, if you have them. And that's something that's important to nurture in yourself as well. And then uh, I think I said self-exploration is a great place to start and something that you should you know, never feel uncomfortable doing. Um, but I, re remember that you deserve the best don't don't settle right just live your life fi find your happiness but mostly you're going to be able to do that if you find yourself first right build build yourself into a person at the very least that you're comfortable uh you know uh showing the world and then you mm -hmm. know i mean guard your feelings to an extent right but you'll you'll gradually realize oh you know what one day Probably, if you're if you're exploring this, you're going to be comfortable with strangers realizing that you're gay or saying that you're gay or or what queer whatever or whatever label flavor, hits you, yeah, whatever color of the rainbow, <laughs> um, to strangers. And so, I guess I, well, I guess that message sums up to: it gets better. You're going to learn yourself more. And then the thing that I have found that um, I quickly abandoned and that I think holds people back is: don't look for a definition of yourself, mm. right? Remember experiences, remember feelings, you know, I suppose gather data about yourself and then just stay as open-minded as you're comfortable with. And then even if it's only in porn, push your boundaries just a little bit. Maybe like, oh, okay, well, I don't think I'm going to be into this type of erotic story or video, but this is just me sort of like, you know what, I'm going to take some time. Probably I'll get off on this, but I want to explore something that I hadn't seen before, broaden my horizons, and then, you know, potentially be like, oh, that's really off-putting. That's the end of my evening. I'm going to go watch a, a movie or something. But that experience and that understanding of yourself will help you feel comfortable with all of it. And then the last thing, because it held me up a lot, because mm -hmm. I have, like, a lot of femme energy, right? Like, I really want to learn to Vogue more than anything, <laughs> um, is at some, the thing that helped me with that that I can say is excellent is find a friend or friends that you're comfortable with or come to Austin and hit me up. And then if you have problems like, be, oh my God, people are going to, I've been called, you know, fag or whatever, and I feel subconscious about it, go balls to the wall, right? Like wear a skirt, wear fishnets. I'll lend you a couple of mine if you want. Heels, got a spare pair of those as well. And just like flat, you know, I don't know. In that safe space, like, like, really in space dive space, into it. Like, you know, own it, at least in that one wrist, moment. Go oh, grrr, as many times as you can. And then after that, you'll feel much more comfortable. It's like jumping into a cold pool mm. rather than stepping in. You should know your own path, but don't be afraid to jump. Particularly if the thing that makes you afraid is that it's unfamiliar. 
right? So I'm unfamiliar with something I'm afraid. That's a fear that you should find a way of massaging out or conquering because you'll feel much better when you do. Even if it's something you never come back to, even if you never wear the color pink again, just my advice would be find uh, the best way or ways to be comfortable with who you are. And then from there, life gets so much easier because you're not in your own way anymore. Have a kiki and rip off that Band-Aid at least once in your life. Yeah, yes, yeah. All right. Well, uh, man, there are so many more yeah. of these types of questions I'd love to ask <laughs> you, yeah. but I, uh, I suppose we will have to do this again uh, and hopefully Anytime. not, you know, four years from now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, nah, more frequently than presidential elections. Well. Yeah, go fair with that. to say. We'll okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I definitely want to invite all of you to explore so many of those ideas uh, as well as to really lean into what we've been talking about tonight in terms of community and the significance of all of that. So please join the atheist community of Austin in all of our different platforms and all these different ways, but find those people, mm -hmm. kick those doors open and be connected to other people as you explore your sexuality, as you explore yourself, as you explore your beliefs. Uh, and you know, one way to do that is uh, to keep up what's happening with the ACA on our website, which is atheist community.org. Uh, you can email this show directly with sex at atheist-community or the ACA itself with TV at atheist-community.org. Tomorrow in this space here in the Free Thought Library live, if you were watching this on uh, 1216, objectively Dan and Jason Friedman will be here in the studio. On Sunday, 1218, student Dr. Ben is going to be in town. Uh, he'll be on Talk Heathen with Dan and then on AXP with Jim Barrows. Come and join us in person. It is so great getting to shake hands, getting to have that electric energy of people back in the studio. Uh, you can catch all of those shows at tiny.cc slash AEN podcasts, where there's an audio only version of all of the programs put out by the Atheist Community of Austin. You can connect with us and connect with your community um, in the Facebook Secular Sexuality fan group, tiny.cc slash FBSSG, as well as the Atheist Community of Discord, which is tiny.cc slash ACD Discord. You are just about running out of time to go to the ACA vault. Uh, this month, you can visit tiny.cc slash the ACA vault to see all of our past monthly offerings from the SecX merch store. Uh, there is a 10% discount off of your entire purchase using the discount code the vault. And uh, make sure to come by and check out that blowout special. I really want to take a moment before we show the crew cam to just acknowledge that uh, for the first time, at least on this show, we have done, we will do by the end of this year, 52 episodes in 52 weeks. As I understand it, some of the uh, Sunday shows, because of the scheduling, will actually have 53 episodes this year. And I know that is an incredible point of pride for mm -hmm. our crew and all of the volunteers that have worked so hard to make all of this happen. So I really want to thank all of y'all for making these in-studio appearances happen and look so good and for being willing to uh, brainstorm and talk about all of the different ways that we can utilize this space. So I want to take a moment and show the crew and just thank them for all of their hard work. Really appreciate everything that y'all have done to uh, make this organization look so good. And then, uh, Jamie, before we walk out for the night, I know you, you kind of gave that impassioned speech, but are there any kind of final thoughts or, or just last impressions you want to make sure to leave with the audience tonight? Um... Be open to new experiences. Mm -hmm. When I started trying to find my uh, inner stripper slut, I kind of, uh, I thought like, oh no, no, I'm a, I'm a dom top, I'm this, I'm that, these are the things I'm comfortable with. And now many of the things that I, I thought were the opposite of what I am, I really enjoy. It, oh, until yeah. you kiss that boy on the mouth, you just don't know how it's going to taste. You just don't know. I think that's good advice for all of us. When other people define you, it's easy to recognize that they're putting you in a box. But it's also possible for you to try and define yourself and put yourself in a box. Mm -hmm. Open up that box in a metaphorical, non-vagina sense. <laughs> 
Well said. Well, uh, no matter what your flag is or what color your paint is, uh, whether you're a daddy or a pup or a demigirl or whoever else, I just want to encourage you to go out and give yourself a big ol' orgasm. Or, better yet, give somebody else one.